Hi, I'm Sham and welcome to Unseen's Christmas season. In the next few weeks, we'll be profiling certain people in the film and TV and theatre business and find out their achievements to date and catch up on all their future plans. Miss Chess is a Melbourne singer, songwriter and producer who developed a passion for the entertainment industry in her teens. She then spent the next two decades writing, directing and producing hundreds of well-known TV ads in her production and media company. Currently, Miss Chess has just released her independent Christmas single, ready for this, Happy, Jolly, Very Extra, Merry Christmas. And it comes in a pretty significant moment for the results of what has been achieved in literally only one week since its last minute official digital release. And Miss Chess joins me now. Hi, Miss Chess, how are you today? Hello, Sham. Thank you for having me. Lovely to have you on the show. Thanks. Can you tell us about some of your, I guess in your opinion, your biggest wins and some of the more maybe challenging experiences you've had as an artist? Look, it's been really interesting times. For me, because I'm not just a performer who's a singer, it goes right across the board. So my whole career goes right across from voiceover artist to performer singer to some comedy and then to a host and a whole combination of things. I think what's really interesting is I took a very strong focus on production for the middle section of my life. Then I went through that time that some of us girls go through where we feel we should have a family, and I did that. Yeah. It was a very difficult journey. That's probably, that's probably um, created why I'm here today. Mm. Um, and so I took time to have a family, and I have a beautiful little family. And then the biggest win, I think, is now, mm. because after all the things that one has been through and all the lessons that you've learnt and all the experiences you've had, the ups and the downs, um, and the opportunities to some, do some great things, um, including hosting a show and all those things. After this lockdown, we've had such a huge um, retrospective look into ourselves as human beings. And just before lockdown, I had finally gone through growing my children to an age where they were a little bit more independent. They're still little, but very strong, very fabulous. Yeah. And I'd started performing again. So I, because I'd been so far out of the industry as a performer for more than a decade, mm -hmm. when I did start to perform again, I was doing very exclusive private soirees. And our, our performances were with some extraordinary um, musicians. I work with uh, the wonderful Dunya Lavrova, who is a... Um, English, Russian, extraordinary violinist. So she was a child prodigy. So she's Featured one of my... in your... Yes. yes. So she's a bit of a soul sister. We've got <laughs> some great stuff planned as we go along. And then I'd be singing with a wonderful Russian uh, pianist called Tamara Vasilevitsky. And then we'd be at, at Peter Jansen's. You know Peter in Melbourne? I do. Melbourne icon, yeah, iconic yeah. fellow. Um, so, you know, James Morrison would drop in and we'd sing together. Mike Brady was always there. So we do these fantastic soirees. I ended up producing those, which was great bringing in some fabulous acts and setting up the whole the whole um, gambit of those and performing on the nights and also planning the night who would perform hosting them and that was starting to be so much fun and as a performer I, always, I felt like I'd, I now had control of myself and a real influence on who I would be and who I was and that was fantastic it was all happening before COVID hit then I got invited to perform in a show for Ella Levy, who's um, Ella Levy, who's Ella's music club, yeah. and she they had a show called Four Divas. So that was Tamara, Donya, myself, and a fabulous uh, opera singer called Rada, mm -hmm. and um, we did this great show last year. And then it all hit. We we were about to start a, <sighs> a, uh, a little project called the Secret Soiree Club. Yeah, we were setting up all these little secret gigs. People would buy tickets. They wouldn't know till three days before where they were. Yeah. And they would turn up first gig planned. We had it all gone, all going, and then COVID, COVID hit, and hit. we sat there going, "If we run with this, we're doing the wrong thing, aren't we?" So we were sitting there going, "Ethically, where do we stand?" So we stopped. Yeah. We just stopped everything, and from March, the majority of performers have not earned a cent. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the performers who are on, we haven't spoken about it yet, on this song that I've just produced, we all talked. Yeah. Literally, nobody had earned money. Mm -hmm. So from March, so gigs were just starting to trickle in. A lot of these people had mortgages, children, and all those that they still have to service. Yeah. And it's just a really difficult time for all of us. We've had to rethink and reevaluate our entire lives. So what is my greatest win is the fact that I finally feel like I wanted to do something. I took it by the horns. I paid for everything myself. I took every bit of experience I have in all the production and all the marketing and all the performance, pulled it all together, 
kept being told along the production process, oh, you can't do that and you can't do this and it doesn't work that way. And I just go, yep, whatever. And I just go and, and just do, do it, it anyway. anyway. <laughs> and I've got to the other end of it, way too close to Christmas because it is a Christmas song. Yeah. And we've done amazing things in one week from the time our song was launched mm -hmm. to now from what I consider I have really no real fan base because I've been out of it forever. We've gone from, for example, on Spotify, mm -hmm. which has probably 36% of the dig digital download market. Definitely. Um, we've gone from zero to just over 1,200 followers mm -hmm. on Miss Chess page just in less than a week. That's amazing. And that's just by pure marketing, getting yeah. out there, doing stuff and, and marketing, advertising, you know, word of mouth, people loving the song. And this is only this week. I'd like to see what happens by next week. I just got onto some playlists in Poland, <laughs> Nambia, Pakistan, really? just, <laughs> the US. I'm just like, it's just been fantastic. And it's just nonstop. Yeah. So at, for people who are out there trying to achieve something with their career, look, everyone's waiting for someone else to do the job for them. I'm just a person who goes, you know what, if I want this chance, I just have to do it myself. That's yeah. exactly what I've done. That's it. You've got to grab it by the horns. It's such, a, it's such an emotional song for me. It came because one of my daughters who was suffering a real mental anguish during COVID um, and during the lockdown where literally she came to me one day and she was literally falling apart. And she just sat in my arms and she's like, mommy, mommy, why can't we see our friends? We oh. can't even go down the street. We, like we would go down the street. We can't go to the park. Like it's right next to us. We can't walk into it. Yeah. You know, this Christmas, we all need more Christmas than ever ever oh and I literally sat there looking at her going you are she's the most emotionally intelligent human being I've met that's mm -hmm. that big and I thought oh wow and I thought what can I do for this child so I started working on this song which I had sort of started 10 years ago but it was a Christmas song mm -hmm. and it had to do with the words happy and we were workshopping it and she literally added to it even though she's not on the writer's credits yeah. <laughs> she'll she'll obviously gain any any benefit if any if we ever if we ever make any money in this australian music industry um and literally we finished the song i, or I finished writing it i i gathered together some great industry people that i work with um and then started working through facetime i have never done sessions and and production work through facetime this was a whole new experience that yeah. i don't particularly love i'm a real hands-on you know 100%. look at someone's eyes it's so person. hard to do so facetime it's, it's impossible so hard the second that covid um released its restrictions that the state government released their restrictions we were straight into toyland recording studios with my mate adam cal down there and everyone was coming in so I, and at that time I had a plan that I was just bringing in some of my industry friends just to do backing vocals. And I was just like, eh, it doesn't have to be all about me. It should be about all of us because this is about all of us. It's having a happy, jolly, very extra Merry Christmas. It was like, I always wanted to write it. It was like a super califragilistic expialidocious yes, Christmas. That's yeah. what I was trying to do. I had organized my distribution for, through a US distributor, which is CD Baby. And I had rung them one night trying to speak to someone and said, is there any chance whatsoever that we can get on before Christmas? And they said, these are our processes. This is the timing. If you submit on this day, it takes approximately three weeks. And I'm looking going, that we're at the end of November. Mm. Oh, so basically I was told pretty much no, because at the end of three weeks when they release it, you then have two more weeks before it usually uploads to Spotify, to oh, Apple to Music. So, so this is five weeks at the end of November. So I just went, oh, I don't care, I'll do it anyway. Yeah. So I've gone ahead, I've got everything right, I've got my CD cover right, I've got the final production, my masters are there, I've got my ISRC codes, everything ready to go. And I put it all up, as soon as I hit send, I put in another call to CD Baby. And I, four days later, got a call mm -hmm. to say, um, look, you know, no, there's no way you can get, early, get it done earlier. Something said no this is not right so I sat there and I wrote this I composed this email it took me a few hours and I literally talked about the fact that through no fault of our own here the state government has shut us down mm -hmm. we would have been ready with this song way back but we couldn't get out and get into studio and That's it was it. it was a very it was it was like applying for the best job in the world and you had one chance yeah I got a little message back from this boy who'd been talking to me saying, you know what, I'll see if I can escalate it. So I'm at this point and I'm going, I've got this boy who's just said, I'm going to escalate. Half an hour later, 
I got the letter saying it's just going ping out to everywhere. <gasps> oh my goodness. And I just literally said, I, I, I fell on the floor. Yeah. I was sobbing. Oh. I was completely sobbing. <laughs> oh my God. So let's have some playback on Miss Chess's brand new single entitled Happy Jolly Very Extra Merry Christmas. It's a long one. Give it a watch. <laughs> All the kids in bed try to stay awake As stars are shining bright There's peasants in a tree And noises up the chimney Who could it be in the middle of the night? On the roof can you hear there's a jingle Happy, jolly, very extra merry Some got sun and some got snow But the sky's more blue when your friends all show up soon Joyful and extraordinary. It won't matter if you're big or small. Come home and new friends, one and all, for a happy, jolly, very extra merry Christmas. There are stories round the table as music fills the air. You laugh till you cry and you eat too much and you dance all night like you don't have a care. Entrepreneur Alexander Vass's success is from his extensive theatrical background and experience. Originally, he studied drama, and then he went on to perform in musicals, plays, and in TV shows. Then, he became Australia's youngest agent, representing 300 artists. He was Victorian president of Theatrical Agents Association for several years, and as an independent producer, his successes include Fiddler on the Roof with Topol, It's a Dad Thing, All My Sons, just to name a few, as well as funding films in the last few years, Alex owns Vass Productions as well as the Alex Theatre in St Kilda. Here with uh, Alex Vass today. So thanks so much for coming in and joining us, Alex. You're welcome. Now, I did not know that your um, experience was so vast because you've been around a long time, but you studied drama and you also uh, were an actor, plays, mm -hmm. um, television shows. Musicals, and musicals. TVs, yeah, film. Yeah. 
Um, I started very young. Um, I, I started at National Theatre Drama School, actually around the corner. Yep. Uh, I, was, I was basically born in Bridgend St Gilda many years ago and um, had a love of the arts always. Um, worked, you know, worked a daytime job and then at night studied drama until I got into the business. Uh, I had an agent at the time and I probably did every show under the sun those days. I did everything from Cop Shop to Holiday Island wow. to, to, um, uh, to Skyways. I, I think I did over 20 productions in those days because there shortage, was a shortage of, of young actors at the time. So I was in a very lucky position that there was always work and I grew starting as an extra to doing bit parts to getting longer parts. And, but I love musicals. I did lots of stage musicals at the time, professional, non-professional and professional. Victoria had the most amazing non-professional theatre and still has in the country. In fact, part of the world, the, the standard of non-professional theatre in, Vic, in, in Victoria is so high. Mm. It's, a lot of it's almost a professional standard. And a lot of out-of-work professionals at, like myself at the time needed that training that we didn't get by doing those shows. Uh, so that grew us into theatres. And what happened was, in a very early age, um, I, I, I didn't... I thought I wasn't progressing because I didn't know the people in the industry. I didn't know the big producers or the directors. And some people just seemed to be getting ahead. Um, so what I did was, my agent got ill and she said, oh, um, I'm going to have to retire because I'm, going to, I'm very ill. And oh, I this said, is well, the opportunity. The opportunity, yeah. And I said, well, why can't I do it? And she said, well, you're very young. I said, I'm an actor. I can act an agent. Yeah. I said, yeah. So I grew a beard to look older. She thought I was Jewish. We all thought and, it. So I grew older. And I took over her agency. I asked all the actors to join me. I had a little office down the road here. And how many clients you had over half? That, no, that, when I started there, it was about 50 to 60 clients. And then I grew. Within three years, I had agencies in Sydney, Melbourne and, and Perth. Wow. And I opened the first multicultural agency in Australia. Yeah. So I had a lot of uh, ethnic actors on board, and, uh, and which was needed at the time. And then I also thought, oh, my God, what do I do? So I ended up buying a, a theatre restaurant in South Melbourne called The Stage Door so I could produce my own shows to put my actors in who were out of work yeah. to use the directors that I knew to direct shows. And I started producing little musicals and plays. So becoming an agent, did you actually get to know the people? No, I did like actually. I get to know yeah. them a lot. And See? But funny enough, I couldn't, I couldn't do the work at the time because I was busy trying to agent. In those days, it's different today. Today, you're digital. In those days, we used to type up all the resumes and get the photos. I used to hand deliver them, go and sell the people personally to the to the producers, but I got to know them all and, and become friends with them over the years. And, and over a period of time, I realised that, you know, you know, you get 10% of, of, of an actor's fee and it's a lot of work and I wanted mm. to go back to doing something else. So I ended up selling the agencies. As well. But in between then, I became um, a member of the Victorian Agents Association. Yeah, and then right. from there, I became, uh, eventually became um, the um, uh, the chairman of the uh, Victorian Agents Association. You were the president, uh, weren't president, you? President, yeah, president. Yeah, I, took, right. I, I took over from, I'm thinking his name was Sitko, was a long time ago. Um, John, I think it was John Cernay. But anyway, I took okay. over him for two years, and that was a treat in itself. And so you also became an, in, an independent producer. Yes. So starting with that, um, the South Melbourne, the... Um, the the theatre the, restaurant. The theater. stage or theatre restaurant, But yeah. just listing a few of them, Fiddler on the Roof, Armadeus. Uh, that came years later. Yeah. Well, actually, no, early, in the early years, I produced shows with a, a couple of partners, and we produced... We st I started with a show called... Um, the Three Guys Naked from the Waist Down, which was an off-Broadway show, which I wanted... I, I bought off Broadway to, to be in myself. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, oh, no, I'd better if I co-produce it. And we did it at a theatre that used to be called The Universal down in Fitzroy. Yeah. Um, and it was an amazing theatre, the, the Universal. It was, um, it was two theatres run by um, um, uh, uh, three young guys. And we actually got to stage our show there. And then from there, I thought, oh, I can produce nice little shows to make lots of money. I don't know if you can produce lots of shows, and it's always the odd one that makes lots of money. We did Tokyo Shock Boys which was one of the rudest shows oh, around. Right. And, and, that, and that, that cost 10 grand and made a million. And the one that's cost 500 grand lost 200, you know. Yeah, so yeah, it's, yeah. it's a risk every time you yeah. do a show. So we produce shows and like that. And, those, and then I started producing some bigger shows with those guys like Hair, which we... Yeah, I want to yeah. ask you about well, that. Well, we started, we started at the, the Universal Theatre and we sold out for three months. Mm -hmm. And then we moved... It. The Athenaeum was reopening. Yeah. And so with the boys there, we opened up at the Athenaeum. Now, that Hair production, was that the John English... One or no, no, another? No. Co Colin Setches? No, 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 it wasn't. No, no, oh, no, no, I've, no. I've known no, a few. No, that, 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 that was the first production back from. Uh, we hadn't been staged in for 20 years. And we had a lot of flack at the time from the XX producer of the original show. It couldn't sure. believe that we were actually doing the show at the time. But it was one of those shows that we were born with a lot of uh, you know, general good actors. Um, but um, uh, there, there wasn't much work around at the time, so sure. we, and we started in that small theatre, which was a, a 350 seater, and brought it to the Athenaeum, which was a 900 seater, yeah, and sold out for a year. Yeah. You know, yeah. Then we yeah. toured around Australia. Gotcha. You know. But you, you've covered off. I mean, I'll, I'll finish off with the musical. But um, Joseph and his technical dream coat. Yeah. The st a street car a named, named Desire. Desire. I did Hamlet, that in the West End. I've done, lots of, I've, I've done. I've been involved in lots of shows. I think over 70 in my lifetime in musicals uh, and plays. Yeah. And um, 
uh, some of my favourite course I did Fiddle on the Roof with Topol. I brought Topol to Australia to do that in 1998, and that was a major production because that, that the opening sales that morning of the box office, we broke the box office record at the Regent Theatre and sold $4 million of the tickets in one day. Wow. And that was phenomenal because I couldn't get through. So you, was, you had a hit, we had not, a, not we, a miss. Well, well, I knew that when I was bringing High Amount here to do the show that where there's a Jewish community in, in, in Victoria that was going yeah. to come and see it. And also, more importantly, because he's one of the most, if not the most famous um, Israeli actors in the world, but also the fact that people love the, the, the story anyway. Yeah. The film's a great film. So it was, it was one of those heartfelt stories I wanted to produce. And you've done quite a few world, uh, Australian premieres, a few yes. world premieres and, and Australian tours, but, and, and one was... Bad Jews. Bad Jews were there. Not, <laughs> yeah. I picked Jewish shows uh, because they're, they're not only wonderful people, they follow theatre, but they're a wonderful audience. But I picked Bad Jews because it was a wonderful play. It's one of the funniest plays I've ever seen on Broadway. It ran for four or five years on Broadway. And we brought it here. We, it was at our theatre here and we sold out the first season. We came back for a second season and we sold out again. Then I toured it around Australia and it, it did really well. It's one of those plays that does really well. No worries. Well, the, you've done heaps and heaps of those. Now, quickly... Kate Whitbread, um, you founded Momo Films to produce and distribute films yes. throughout Australia. Yes. Okay. Uh, and some of them were Surviving Georgia. Georgia, yes. Which had Shane Jacobson. Yes. yes. Pia Miranda, Miranda, Holly yes. Valance. Yes. Then you did Cloudburst with Olympia Dukakis. Yes. Yep. Um, now, you've got a few in, in production now. Yes. But Could I really you? want to ask you one question now, especially because we've gone through all the musicals and now, now we're at the film. Mm -hmm. What do you predict the future of the film industry to be? It's very difficult. We, we just finished a film called The Unlit, which we, um, in fact, we're premiering in fr Friday night at Toledo um, for the cast and crew. And it's a, it's a witchy horror movie and um, it's what the flavour of the month is. And when we go out to the, to the markets to see what they want, everyone says, produce a horror movie. So we've produced a very low budget horror movie, which, which looks like a multi-million dollar movie. We went into the competition recently in the States. Um, we produce a film clip and all the big people in the market from Netflix and everyone comes, to, they look at it and they yeah. pick. And we added, I think, at 2000, we became, we were in the top 25. Oh, so we were immediately picked up by a major distributor in the US for this film. They thought we spent 10 million. I can't tell you what we did. We, we didn't really yeah, spend right, sure. on this movie. But Kate's brilliant at doing movies on, on low budgets yeah. and, and, and begging and borrowing and stealing from people to make yeah. it work. So the future of Australian films is interesting because there are certain, the, the, the bigger films always get the upside. Everyone else trying to produce films is very difficult. We've discussed here with our friends here at the theatre with Simon and Tim about doing a slate where instead of someone giving someone $20 million um, for, um, for one film, give us $20 million and we'll produce 10 small movies, yeah, 10, million, 10, 10, 10 low budget yeah. movies in Australia. And you get, I think you'll get better pull from because you can very, just as easy to lose at $20 million on one movie, mm. whereas you've got 10 chances of making money. Australia was very good yeah. at making quirky movies good. and we've yeah. missed the boat. We've, we've, we've left all that. We've really missed the boat on it. We've missed the boat on investor. There's the issue about you know, how, getting investors in. We don't get the support from the government. We don't get the support from the film industry we need. Yeah. So we really need to, everyone, we need to get out there and scream at them. Sure. To change it because we're an industry that produces a lot of money in this country. True. And okay. We'll have to wrap it there, but really can't wait to have another chat with you in a few months and see how things are progressing with um, everything that's in progress. Great. Thank you. Good on you. Thanks so Thanks much for your time, Alex. Thank you. Tony. And that's all we've got time for today, guys. If you want to get in touch with us, send us an email at ideas at studioemedia.com.au. Thanks for watching and Merry Christmas. See you next time.